Well, good morning on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning where we gather and to our online community, we welcome you as we uh, celebrate together the risen Christ. Uh, my name is Terry Young and uh, a number of weeks ago, Tom asked me if I would uh, spell, off, uh, spell him off for the Easter Sunday weekend uh, because as you know, he's having some uh, surgery uh, this last week and glad to do so. He also asked me if I wanted to have the uh, backdrop changed for Easter Sunday morning. And I said, no, Tom, uh, because uh, what we want to do this morning is take some time to think about uh, the Easter and the good news of the resurrection uh, as really a matter of an invitation for us to, after our series on behind hidden doors or behind closed doors, to realize that the Easter message is really the message for us to enter through the open door that Christ has made available to us. In John chapter 10, um, before the Passion Week, uh, Jesus uh, communicates the fact that he is the good shepherd. Uh, two times within that teaching of John 10, he makes this statement, I am the door. He says that twice, and he says, I am the door to this life that I want to give to you. I want to give you life that is abundant. Uh, there is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I desire to give you life. I want you to live in fullness and freedom and forgiveness every day. And the Easter story, the story of Passion Week, is actually a story about doors. It is during the final week of Passion Week that Jesus earlier gathers with his disciples in the upper room. They close the door. They have some intimate moments together. They share together a table, a cup, and bread. And Jesus reminds them that this bread and this cup is a testament that he is giving to the world and to them of his life poured out for them. He then makes his way from that closed room out into a garden, and he is there arrested. And that is where the crucifixion uh, begins to unfold, and he is on the cross. In Matthew's Gospel, in the final moments of Jesus on the cross, we read this, that when Jesus breathed his last, there was in the temple in Jerusalem a veil, a fabric door that was torn from the top to the bottom. We don't have time this Easter weekend to go into the mystery and wonder of what is being told to us there, but there is something very powerfully powerful and profound that is being communicated to us about the work of Jesus that opens a door to the very presence of God. Then Jesus is taken down from the cross. As we know, he is taken to a borrowed tomb, and he is placed in that tomb, and the door is closed. There's a rock placed over the opening of that tomb, and it is sealed. It's locked. The Romans ensured that it was locked. And then on Sunday morning, women came to go and find the tomb and to anoint the body of Jesus. And when they arrived, they discovered that the door was opened. They then run from that scene and they go back to the disciples. We're told that the disciples are in a room and they have barred or locked the door for fear of the Jews. And it is there that Jesus encounters them. And they are doubtful. They are drained. Uh, they are discouraged. But Jesus appears in their midst, and it is there that he says to them, peace I leave with you. Now, that Sunday morning, there were two disciples who made their way out of that locked room back to, no doubt, their hometown of Emmaus. Luke, in Luke chapter 24, tells this story, and it's a, one of the stories of the uh, events of that first Sunday morning when Christ had risen from the grave. And Luke records it in this way. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That's about the distance from here, Erickson Covenant Church, to Savon Foods in Creston. They were walking, and as they walked, we're told, they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. It seems that their only recent memory of Jesus was Jesus crucified on a cross, bloodied, bruised, a crown of thorns upon his head. 
and they were unable to recognize him. He was in his resurrected glory, but he was in their midst. And he asked them a question. He comes alongside of them and says, what are you fellows discussing together as you're walking along this road? They're near Jerusalem, just going, heading out of Jerusalem on their way to Emmaus. We're told they stood still and their faces were downcast. It's very clear their emotion was one of great discouragement and despair. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? He's, he's literally saying to Jesus, where have you been, man? I mean, have you been hiding under a rock somewhere? Uh, what's, what's with it? You don't even know what's going on? And Jesus plays along. There's something here about the playfulness of Jesus. He's showing us his heart. And on that Easter Sunday morning, that first morning, when he raised, is from, comes forth from the grave, he is literally playful. He says to these two men, what things? And they continue about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And, and the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. There's a whole world of meaning in that phrase, we had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, and even more puzzling, is it's the third day since all this took place, and in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. The door was open, but they did not see Jesus. The occupant who had been in that locked room was no longer there. He was gone. It's at this point in the early phase of their walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus that Jesus turns to these two men and he says to them, you're being quite foolish and you're being slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Moses or did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Most of the rest of the walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus was Jesus opening up their understanding and their minds that from the law of Moses all through the prophets of the Old Testament, what was said in the scriptures concerning the Messiah was all there, and they had missed it. And these two men must have thought to themselves, here is one who doesn't know what has gone on, and yet he seems to truly know what has gone on, and he also seems to understand why. So the playfulness continues because as they approached the village of Emmaus to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. They turned to the village, perhaps to go to their house. The original plan was to go to their house, go in their room, close the door, and maybe lock the door themselves for fear of the world. And he's playing. He's playful. And they, they come back and they urge him and say, why don't you come and stay with us? It's early evening. Uh, the, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them, and he sits at the table with them, and he in essence turns the table. He becomes the host, and he takes bread that is there, and he gives thanks, and he breaks it, and then he gives it to them. In this moment, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappears from their sight. <laughs> There's a kind of uh, wonderful playfulness here on the part of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, who is going to proclaim to them and to the, the, many of the disciples in the days that follow that he is the Lord of life. He is also the door of life. He's opened the door. He has unlocked the door of sin and death, and he has invited them into a life, a true life. And they asked each other, 
when Jesus disappears from their sight. I don't know about you, but when we were walking with him on the road and he opened the scriptures to us, my heart was burning. And the other agreed and said, yeah, something was going on inside of me. It was visceral. I could feel it. I didn't understand it at the time, but we now know that the Messiah, Jesus, has been in our midst. And they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They walked back the seven miles. There they found the eleven. And those with them, they were assembled together and said, It is true, the Lord has risen. And then the two told what had happened to them on the way. And how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Some scholars believe that one of the things that opened their eyes was that when Jesus took the bread in the giving of thanks, they had heard that voice before, heard those words before, but then for the first time they saw, as he reached out the bread, they saw his hands. And they would have seen the evidence, the marks of the crucifixion. And in all of this, they are in wonder and awe. And they recognized that Jesus was alive. And he broke the bread. And he shared with them his life. A number of years ago, there was a theologian by the name of Moltmann who said that with Easter, the laughter of the redeemed begins. If there's to be any mood, any thought, any kind of sense that we should have about Easter reality, about walking a third day road, about walking in, in the truth of the door of life, Jesus himself, it should be one of joy. It should be one of celebration. It should be one of playfulness because the door through Jesus is opened to life. He says to his disciples in many of his appearances, peace I leave with you. He's saying, I want, do not want you to live in fear any longer. Some people define life, L-I-F-E, as living in fear every day. For some people, it's living in frustration every day. It's living in futility every day. It may be living in failure every day. And Jesus says, no longer. The life that I, has given, I have given to you is this, L-I-F-E. I want you to live in fullness every day. I want you to live in freedom every day. I want you to live in forgiveness every day. From this day forward, walk up and into life. It is fully yours to live through me. And in essence, Jesus is saying, welcome to the kingdom of the open door. And from this point forward, we see a people who hours earlier had barred the door for fear of the world. We see them now walking up to everything. And everyone, boldly, fearlessly, unashamedly. Peter's first message around the day of Pentecost ends with these words. God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you. He sent him to pour out upon you life itself. Not in bits and bites. Not in small portions. Not in puny little measures, but he came to pour out upon you life extravagantly. He said this earlier in John 10, I am the door for you to enter into life, and I have come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. I want to give you the extravagant gift of life. There are then two words that stand out and become the life theme for the people of the open door. These two words are the words peace and grace. Now, in the resurrection appearances of Jesus, he says to them numerous times, peace I leave with you. Be at peace. You have peace with God. You have peace within your own hearts. I want you to explore and I want you to live out your peace that goes horizontally to those around you. I want you to be men and women of peace. He also wants them to understand that through him has come grace. All of the favor of God poured out upon them. And this is where we see in the New Testament the story of the early church and the writings of Paul and Peter and John, the writings of Jude, uh, the letter that, or the, the work of John and the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Old Testament, What you discover is that all of these letters of Paul, Peter, John, Jude, all of them 
begin with a kind of uh, setting out of what it is all about. And we, we read a phrase again and again. I encourage you sometime, just leaf through the New Testament letters of Paul and Peter and so forth, and you will read words like this again and again, over and over and over again, over a dozen times. These words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes these exact same words in numerous letters. To Philemon, he says, to, to grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter begins his letters with this phrase, grace and peace be yours in abundance. John, as he writes in the Revelation, he begins the book of Revelation by saying that the one who appeared to him, it is from him that grace and peace is to you from him, the one who is, who was, and who is to come from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then the last words of the New Testament in John's revelation are these words, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So be it. You get a very clear sense, not simply some kind of impression or vague idea. You get a very, very clear sense that grace and peace are at the core of this life, and they are ours through the open door of Jesus. Jesus himself is the door into life. And this is what the disciples of that first Easter Sunday begin to understand. And this grace and peace is not given in small measure. It is extravagant. It is extravagant. This is hard for us to grasp, hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to comprehend. A theologian, Teilhard de Chardin, a number of years ago, made a point about the structure of the very universe that God has created. He said this, the very physical structure of the universe is love. It is abundance. It is blessing. It is outpouring. If the landscape, he wrote, reveals one certainty, it is that the extravagant gesture is the very stuff of creation. Annie Dillard, in her little book, Pilgrims at Tinker Creek, said, Nature is, above all else, wildly extravagant. It almost seems wasteful. Tillard de Chardin continues, After the one extravagant gesture of creation in the first place, the universe has continued to deal exclusively in extravagance. This extravagance comes to us in so many different ways. When you stop and think about it, at the heart of the Creator, at the heart of Jesus Himself is this extravagance. And when you look at His creation, the latest guess is that there are 8.74 million species in the world, 1.7 million of which we know about there are a thousand kinds of trees. There are almost a half million kinds of plants. There are almost a million kinds of bugs. There are more than 30,000 varieties of weeds. And there are 3,000 species of mosquitoes. One would have been enough. But nature is, above all else, extremely, wildly extravagant. If this is true of creation... The same can and must be said of redemption, of the whole plan and purpose of God in the good news of Jesus, in the, the whole offer of life, that Jesus comes to open the door to life, and he does not open up to us a life that is in bits and bites. He is not doling out to us peace and grace in Dixie Cups. In fact, when Paul writes in the New Testament about the grace of God, he uses descriptors like the word indescribable, uh, surpassing, abundant, abounding, freely, uh, indescribable or incomparable. It is something that is lavished upon us. And so you get the idea that there is an extravagance to this life that Jesus has given us, and if the, if the landscape of Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection reveals any certainty, it is that the extravagant gesture 
is the very stuff of the new life and the new beginnings of grace that are ours through Him. This is, as I said a bit earlier, really hard for us to comprehend. If we could actually see the extravagance of God's grace and peace, I think we would be speechless. I think we would, in our own way, uh, sort of echo the words of Fessick and the prin uh, Princess Bride. It's inconceivable if we were really to take time to understand how the outpouring of life in Christ is not in bits and bites. It's not in drabs. It's not in drips. It is flowing and flowing and flowing. In fact, John in the Revelation says the voice of the risen Christ, the exalted Christ, was like the roar of many waters. It gives the idea and the impression that it's, it overwhelms the senses. I want to share with you something that I came across a few years ago in a marvelous little book by Belden Lane. Belden Lane wrote a book called The Solace of Fierce Landscapes. And in this book, he tells the story of a, a man who lived many years ago. He worked uh, with the French military in the northern regions of Africa. His name was Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And it was there that he, he worked and he wrote and he talked about and wrote about uh, the Moors that lived there, the Bedouin tribes that lived in North Africa. He, he said that they, they had been bred in sun-scorched uh, realms a lean sense of hunger, an awareness that the God of the de desert is never given to excess or waste. And the French pilots and saint Exupere and others uh, talked about trying to tame the Moors, trying to civilize them. And so they would, they would tell them of France and the superiority of France. And at one point, they took three of the men uh, across the Mediterranean, then they made their way to Paris, and they showed them the steamships and the locomotives, and they showed them the Eiffel Tower. The Bedouin Arabs were, were not impressed. But, but when they saw the sight of trees in Europe, they wept. Uh, the only natural world they had ever known was flagrantly stingy with all of its gifts. Years of desert attentiveness had trained them to expect only shortfall and subtly. Back home, when water was precious, they might walk for days on end in search of a tiny spring, maybe a handful of palms. So when they stood in a high alpine meadow beside an enormous waterfall in the French Alps, its water roaring out of the mountain in a huge braided column, they had no way of comprehending such lavishness. Saint Exupere writes, they stood in silence, mute, solemn, gazing at the unfolding of a ceremonial mystery. That which came roaring out of the belly of the mountain to them was life itself. It was the lifeblood of man. The flow of a single second would have resuscitated whole caravans that mad with thirst, had pressed on into the eternity of salt lakes and mirages. Here, God was manifesting himself. It would not do to turn one's back on him. And then St. Exuperate notes that these Bedouins refused to live, leave. They refused to leave, adamantly declaring to their French guide that honor required their waiting, waiting for the end. Knowing the water could not last much longer, they awaited the moment when God would grow weary of his madness, when this wild extravagance would suddenly and finally exhaust itself. Resolutely, they stood their ground. The guide finally had to say to them, but, but you see, you must see, Really realize now, certainly unintelligible as words must seem to such men, you, you must see this water has been running here for a thousand years. Having known the depths of desert thirst, these men could scarce, scarcely fathom a surging torrent of water rushing forever from the rock. 
Nothing had prepared them for it. They had learned through the years an indifference to everything, less than love. But they must stand in silent awe before a raging cataract, beholding in wet-eyed wonder the unwearying madness of their God. This is a picture of the extravagant gesture of nature to the New Testament believers This was also the picture of the extravagant gesture of God's grace and peace that was now theirs through Christ himself. He had opened the door. And he was saying to them now, I want you to open this door and walk through it. And I want you to live your life in freedom, in fullness, and in forgiveness. The open door to life that is Jesus is a door that opens to God's peace and grace. In no small measure, it is wildly extravagant. And my encouragement to us on a very practical level is that we should open this door every day. We must daily learn to remember the lavishness that is ours of God's grace, His favor, His blessing that is poured out to us in Christ like a never-ending torrent flow of his life and flourishing. We must daily remember the lavishness of peace that is ours. And yet this may be where our challenge is. As C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity, the challenge of the Christian faith and the Christian life begins and comes where most of us don't usually look for it. It comes first thing in the morning. It's the first thing in the morning where all of our wishes and worries and frets come at us like wild animals. And the first job, Lewis says, every morning is to shove them all back and to listen. Listen to that other voice. Letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. Standing back from all of our natural fussings and frettings. Coming in out of the noise of our world and then standing under the flow of God's love and God's grace and God's peace. It is made available to us and given to us in abundance, lavishly, in an abounding way, in an indescribable way. And this is the life that Jesus came to give to us. And so there's a bit of a challenge. And in the final moments, I want us to think about the challenge, about what we do with this and how we live this out. And I've made the point that there is a learning that we need, and that is to daily remember and daily receive the lavishness of God's grace. But I want to warn us of a danger. And the danger is that we can enter into life and go through our days and go through our weeks and go through our months and begin to take our eyes off of the great gift of life that God has given us in Christ, and we begin to think that other things are more important, our riches, our wealth, our treasures, the things that we take hold of, and we can look at all those things and say, look at me, I've really got a good life. I've got a blessed life, and we forget the blessing of heaven. In John's Revelation, there is one letter that is written to one of the seven churches of Asia And it is a letter that is delivered by the resurrected, exalted Christ. And he comes to one particular church, and it's a church that is in the the, the region of Laodicea. And Jesus comes in the midst of those people, and he says, "I've, I've observed your life, and I've observed that you are rich, and you have great wealth. You don't need a thing, humanly speaking. But you don't realize that you've become really pitiful and poor and blind, and I want to come and I want to give you once again gold. I want to give you clothing. I want to cover your shameful nakedness. I want to heal your eyes so that you can see. Then Jesus makes a very uh, fascinating statement. He says to this group of people who are his followers, I'm outside the door of your life, and I'm knocking on the door. I want you to open the door. I want you to let me in. If you'll hear my voice, open the door. I will will fully come in 
and I will sit at table with you. And to me, it brings to mind what he did with Cleopas and his friend. He will come in and he will, he will act as host. And he will serve you at the table of life. Peace and grace. But he wants us to open the door. So in these final moments of this Easter Sunday, I want to encourage us to remember that Jesus is the door of life. He came to bring a door that opens to life. It is full of grace and peace. And He stands in our midst and He stands outside often our lives and He's knocking on the door, I think, daily to say, would you let me in? Let me bring in the full measure of all that I came to give you, peace, the possession of adequate resources for all you're dealing with, and as well, grace, the unbounded favor of God, the blessing of God that comes to you freely, fully immersed in riches, yours for the taking. So now, open the door and allow Jesus to be your life for the days to come. God bless you on this Easter Sunday morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.